Hi guys, welcome back to We Should Talk, an interview series from In The Know. I'm your host, Gibson Johns, and today on the podcast, we have Drew Offwallow, who is a TikTok star, content creator, and the host of the Spotify-exclusive podcast, The Comment Section. Drew is hilarious. She's super smart, and she really broke out on TikTok by doing these videos where she would stitch somebody who was being openly misogynistic or bigoted or just toxic towards women online in a video, and she would, as she says, fight fire with fire. She would be kind of openly openly mean back to them she kind of roasts them she gives them a taste of their own medicine however you want to say it Um, and these videos garnered a lot of attention a lot of views and um, you know she has this podcast the comment section where she takes kind of those same ideas or a lot of those same ideas and she just goes deeper with them with some great guests and um, you know she again she's she's so she knows exactly she knows what she's talking about she's She's done a lot of work on herself to sort of unlearn a lot of the internalized biases, not just misogyny, but just like bias in general that, you know, we all have because of just the nature of the patriarchal society that we've been brought up in. And, you know, it's on us to do some of that work to unlearn these things. And because she has done the work on herself, she just knows what she's talking about. She has these amazing conversations. She has, gives these amazing tools on on, on how she's done so. And um I just love what she puts out there. She's trying to make the internet a better place, or at least a place with a little bit less misogyny, a little bit, a few, a few less people who are being openly misogynistic online, and um, by just by again by giving them a taste of their own medicine. So I love talking with Drew. We had a great conversation about her platform, about her podcast, um, and also at the end we talked about being a Swifty and going to the Eras tour, as well as some Jonas Brothers fanfic that she wrote back in the day. So keep listening for my interview with Drew Off Wallow. Check out the comment section on Spotify, and please rate, review, and subscribe to We Should Talk on Spotify or wherever your podcasts. All right, so we're here with Drew Afwalo, who is the host of the comment section, a hilarious podcast that if you have not checked it out, you have to. Drew, mm-hmm. thanks so much for being here. How are you? I'm so great. Thank you so much for asking, and I'm happy to be here. Happy yes, to- and happy I, to- I understand you <laughs> celebrated your birthday not too long ago. Happy belated. Thank you so much. Yes, I turned 28 on Monday, the 18th. What, so. What'd you do to celebrate? I went to Disneyland with my family and friends and it was love very, it. very fun. Yeah. Love it. Love it. <laughs> um, so let's just jump right into it. I mean, so you really broke out with this, this a very specific kind of video that you were posting on TikTok where you, like mm-hmm. either you would find uh, somebody who was posting something super toxic and, and misogynistic or somebody yeah. would send you one of those videos and it's usually <laughs> men talking about women and mm-hmm you would just stitch their videos and you would say, and you would kind of roast them right back. You would give them a taste of their own medicine, basically. And I I guess my first question is like, when you, when you break out with something like so specific, you know, it's like, like a certain kind of video. Yeah. What kind of conversations or kind of thoughts went through your mind when you were like, like after the breakout happened and you're like, okay, sort of, how do I expand what I do beyond that? Or, or while keeping sort of what people love about me going like what were some of those things that you that you thought about sort of around that time around that inflection point yeah I mean when I initially started posting on TikTok I more so just told stories I was just kind of talking about my own unfortunate interaction <laughs> with old <laughs> men which is not exclusive to me many people mm-hmm. have uh stories that are like that and I think my ability to captivate an audience obviously happened after I started like really like being mean to awful men. <laughs> um, but prior to that, like my initial, you know, grab was kind of just entertaining, just like right. talking. There's obviously like a huge facet of entertainment intertwined with what it is I do. I think at a very superficial level, obviously it's like it's being mean to men. It's telling them to suck my wiener. We all love that. Like, that's so funny. Um, But I think at the very, like, genesis of my platform, it's really just about empowerment. And it's about, like, giving anyone who is not a man or doesn't identify as a man um, the power and the autonomy to, like, decide that they don't have to be nice or patient with people who are bigoted, um, specifically men. And I feel like a lot of times, depending on where you sit on the intersection of oppression, that if you're at the very top, like they're so not used to being checked. Like they're not used to being clocked. They're not used to being dragged. They're not used to being made fun of. Um, and they're sure as hell not used to it 
happening on a scale as large as my platform, which obviously didn't start that way. It grew that way organically. Right. Um, and I think the reason why I was able to kind of branch off into other mediums is because at the very heart of my messaging, it's all about like empowering you. Like it's about telling you that you don't have to put up with this kind of behavior and that doesn't make you a bitch. That doesn't mean you're a bad person. And that doesn't mean you're going to die alone. It means that you're going to hold a standard that you would hold for yourself for your partner. And then when that time comes, you'll find them and you'll be happy and loved and fulfilled. And it's, I'm living proof, right? Because I feel like the messaging from misogyny, a lot of times, like there's this um, trope that like, if you're a disagreeable woman, if you're loud, if you're mean, if you stand up for yourself, if you're very like independent, you're never going to find a man who loves you if you're attracted to men, right? Um, and I'm living proof that's not true. Like, that's not true at all. And totally. so I, my the heart of my messaging is why I was able to kind of branch off into other territories because you go all kinds of ways with that. Of course, like, yeah. And especially like the comment section is a perfect example. It was something where people wanted to hear me talk in a longer form and they wanted to hear me talk for longer. And I was like, careful what you wish for. Uh, <laughs> I would love to do that. So I think it, um, that was kind of something I feel like I understood, but more so when I, you know, blew up and then got signed and then started working with brands and stuff, that's kind of when I was really like, okay, I could really do something with this. Like I could really yeah. branch off into other forms of media that don't um, always have to be short form content. And they don't always have to be jokes. Like they don't always have to be sillies. Um, my show, I think is just as educational as it is entertaining. I completely fun. agree. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, I think that's, I think that's kind of why um, I was able to transition into different forms of media or longer forms or more traditional forms of media. Um, but yeah, I'm very, yeah. always grateful for the short form. Of, co of, of course. <laughs> but I also, I also, I've seen you say before, like, and I love this is that, you know, you, you kind of serve as inspiration for a lot of people and, and, and people, I think mm -hmm. will send you things so that you can check people. But you like, one of your messages is like, you know, people actually don't need you to help to, to like do that. Like they can do it yeah. on their own once they've kind of learned from you or, or whatever, you know, I think that's a, such a great message to send. Oh yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I, I feel too, that I feel very strongly about that, especially because I feel like it's important that they hear it from me. Right. That, um, all I am is like a vessel for you. It's like a, a way for you to see that it is possible to still have the life that you want, but not have to compromise your morals or your boundaries. And so at the same time, I'm always like, it, if you want a second opinion and you want permission, I'll give it to you. You could be mean to them. <laughs> right, of course. Right, but right. I'll, I'll give you, I'll, I'll stand in and I'll give you the permission. But I feel like my audience, especially now, knows like how supportive I am of them and I want them to be know that they have the ability to do what I do too um mm -hmm. <laughs> they just have to give themselves permission to use it absolutely so. yeah and 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 you say and you've said like you know you're you've described your like method as being basically fighting fire with fire and yeah and you know it's like these men are being overtly and openly toxic towards women online so like why not give them a taste of their own medicine why mm -hmm. why does that strategy work so well in your eyes why does that get kind of cut through the noise and just like and just work yeah I mean I think I think the biggest reason would be the study that I reference a lot in my interviews and stuff which is like that they surveyed like if you're just operating within a gender binary they surveyed like a hundred men and a hundred women and they asked them what their greatest fear is and for men or for women it was being murdered uh for men it was being humiliated and so that's why it works. It, 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 the reason why it works is because the men that I stitch are bigoted in more ways than one, nine times out of 10. It's not just misogyny. They have many different right. facets. It's, facets a, it's across the spectrum. Right, exactly. Yeah, they, yeah. they check all the boxes on, on the bigotry scale. Right. Um, misogyny is just one of them. So I, I think that men who feel so boldly as to platform bigoted ideals and find them funny um, they obviously fall under that umbrella of men who their biggest fear is being humiliated. Mm. And so the reason why it works and why I've been able to like garner an audience is because I have put them on the spot. Like I've given, I, I don't let them defend themselves and I don't debate with them. I just humiliate them. And what it does is it, what it doesn't change them. I mean, maybe it has, I doubt it, but like, 
maybe it has changed someone, but of the overarching theme is that it, it, it humiliates them to the point where they don't want to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's my only, like my only goal. Is, and I feel like when I, there was criticism of how I choose to fight fire with fire, which logistically speaking is very possible. Like literally speaking, they do that a lot. Um, <laughs> they do fight fire with fire. Actually. I think that it's um, to expect that women, especially women who sit lower on the scales of oppression to be patient and kind with you, even when you're being openly bigoted and antagonistic towards them is an entitlement. And it's a facet of white supremacy, if we're being honest. So mm -hmm. these men, even though they wandered into my den and they upset me on purpose, they still, even at that level, expect me to be nice to them because that's what they've been conditioned to believe is the right way for women to act. Mm. That's just what they believed for the longest time. Really wild, yeah. And that's why they get so angry at me <laughs> because they're, they're not, not used to that treatment. That. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, and I think that's why it works because at the same time that I'm humiliating them, I'm validating the anger and the frustration of everybody else that they affect with these jokes, right? I tell them, you don't have, you don't have to laugh at that if you don't like it. You don't have to laugh at that. You don't have to be nice to them. And you sure as hell don't owe them anything other than your wrath. If that's what you want to do and you want to be mean back, then by all means you should. That's what I do. Right. 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 So, like, yeah. yeah, there we go. Uh, right. Totally. Yeah, I, I do believe that's why, you know. Mm -hmm. And you so. you mentioned like you're not sure if this has changed anybody. Like hopefully yeah. it maybe has. But so have you never like as none of the men that you've ever called out have ever like messaged you or commented like hey, let's have a conversation. Hey, you have a point. Hey, X, Y, Z. Like n nobody has ever done that? Um, No, it's more, they have messaged me. It just hasn't been filled Not, with force. It's more, it. more vitriol. Um, uh -huh. the it's, it's, it, yeah. The only times it has been filled with remorse is when uh, they ask me to take it down because they don't want someone to see it. They don't want their job to see it. Not my problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe you right. should have thought about it before you did exactly. the first and I hold no empathy for them. I do not care. Um, I will never delete videos because of that. No. So I don't even respond to those messages. I just, I, and it's very rare that they come to be honest. Right, the totally. Most frequent, yeah. The most frequent response from them is, is more vitriol and more anger. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Typically. Pret I'm pretending to be shocked. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So let's talk about the literal comment section, not, not the show yet, but just like yeah. your comment section. What does your comment section normally look like? Just like on average on a video like that, what does it look like? Uh, normally it's like probably like 90, 10 positive. So it's yeah. like overwhelmingly positive and everyone's laughing and having a kiki and joining in on the sillies and the, and the drags, which I love. And then there's always like a 10% um, awful men like trying to like clap back at me, which is right. just calling me fat and ugly in a million different fonts. Like that's uh, doesn't work on me. So I don't creative. know. How yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's by no means creative and it's by no means exclusive to me. They'll do that anyways. Even if I post something that has nothing to do with men and it's simply just like a, a cute video, a makeup video, whatever. Uh, they'll still write that. So that is not something that's exclusive to a roast. I think the bigger the video gets, uh, the more vitriol it gets, but then yeah. by the, measure, the more love it gets too. It's very totally. Like, yeah, but, the, but, the, but I feel like the, the, the bigger a video gets, that means like it's reaching more people who don't necessarily follow you. So it's like yeah. probably reaching. Yeah, exactly. So like, so what, do you, what, what, yeah, but what, what kind of tools or things have you like either taught yourself or learned through others or just through experience of like dealing with stuff like that or like honestly just wading into these kind of like toxic environments online where like these videos come from w yeah. what what tools do you use to like not have it affect you or or kind of how do you how do you do that yeah I mean I think uh I prior to like having this platform but even like in building it I I continue to do this and I'll probably continue to do it for the rest of my life but I've I've unpacked a lot of my own internalized biases well before I had a platform um but especially my internalized misogyny, like mm. that is very, very hard to unpack. All the biases are, um, but that one too, as like someone who identifies as a woman and who lives in a world that centers male validation and everything, I think me unpacking that consistently over the years, including when I had the platform or started building it, has strengthened my self-love and my self-worth. And like, it's really helped me you know, change my perspective on whose opinions I value and whose opinions I'm willing right. to take 
and whose opinions I'm willing to let affect me. So I think like that kind of internalized work that I've been doing for a long time and now it's just been fast tracked because of this, I think uh, really helps me to genuinely not care. Like when men write awful things to me, like it does not hurt me, not even a little bit. Sometimes I think, I think I'm kidding. I'm not, but like they can keep doing it. I mean, it, it helps me if I'm being honest, like it just try a different me. angle, right? Exactly. Like, yeah, it, just, out. <laughs> it, it continues to like pad my, my repertoire and my ability exactly. to create more content. So that's fine. And they want to keep doing that. But, um, I think as far as like literal things that I've done, uh, I, I love to make sillies and jokes at this point. I make them, I'm very selective about who I choose to stitch. Cause I'm like, it's just the same jokes over and over again. I want to like find different ones. Now yeah. I only stitch men that I, I, I thought of something really funny and I'm like, mom, I'm going to say that in the video. Uh, so I'm very selective on that point. Now, before I used to do every single one I saw, now I think I'm just more picky. And then, um, I blocked people all the time too. Like I, I block awful men all the time. Like I don't let all of them live in my comments. Like <laughs> And especially if it's just an outright slur or bigotry, like you're gone immediately. Yeah, totally. I, I'm not entertaining you. I'm not going to laugh with you. I'm not going to make fun of you. You're kicked out the club. Like, so I think those are like logistic stuff that I do yeah. um, to protect my like mental space when it comes to that. But as far as like the mental health aspect part of it, I've just like done a lot of internal work to like make sure it doesn't hurt me. And now like I've been right. doing it for so long now, it's just, it's even I'm even more impervious to it now so yeah totally I mean but like you, you, I mean and you said you mentioned this but like you know we just because of the nature of the society that we've all kind of been brought up in yeah. we all have some internalized misogyny and like it, yeah. it is about unlearning that and and kind of fighting back against that yeah like what what specifically have, have I don't know have you there's a lot probably but like is there a specific thing you can mention that like you have unlearned and you're just like I used to do this or I used to think this way and now I've done the work to get to not do that anymore. Yeah. I mean, uh, I talk a lot about this in my book, which is really good too, which is coming out next year. But oh, awesome. I, I, I do, um, I talk a lot about pick me. So like I've talked about like a, the pick me mentality, like where that comes from, how it's like literally stemmed from internalized misogyny. It's like, it's driven by male validation. Like you want to be the one that's picked right. because you're different and you're, and you're not like other girls. I think, as like, as a self-identifying woman in a patriarchal world, I, I was a pick me at one point. We all were, it's okay. We can all say, it. um, it's just important that we don't die that way. That's the only part that matters because it's not our fault if we're indoctrinated into that line of, of thinking. Course. but I think that when I unpack my, when I was unpacking the pick me parts of my brain, I think what really helped me was obviously reading, um, reading a lot of different kind of literature. Um, my sister is gay. So like, that was a huge help for me too, because if you think about it, gay lesbians specifically, they do not care about men. Like, yeah, like right. it's all like, they don't factor them not in a factor. about them. They're, they're so far removed from the male gaze. And I think my sister being gay gave me a lot of perspective too. Um, it really helped me understand how your brain can work and where it can live and still be happy and loved and fulfilled. So that was a huge part of it. My friend circle when I was in college, I was friends with so many different women of so many different backgrounds and ethnicities that they really opened my eyes to a lot of different things that I realized. I'm like, why do I not like that? Like, for example, nails. I did not want nails for a long time I think it's well mostly because I grew up an athlete so I couldn't have them and then I think I just convinced myself like oh they're so inconvenient like I kind of like really hate them uh, <laughs> turns out I don't they're my entire personality and my my friend own it exactly I had brought that up to my friend I'm like oh I just feel like maybe they're like too much and like blah 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 and my friend she looked me in the eyes and she was like I like them so don't know what you're talking about and I was like oh my god geez and then I actually got my first set with her, had him ever since. And Love so that it. was like 2015. So I think um, little things like that, I started yeah, to like, make sense. realize like I was just cutting things out for the sake of being able to say like, oh, I'm so different. I'm not. <laughs> like when they say like, oh, I'm, you're not like other girls. I am. In fact, I'm worse. If we're being honest. Like, that's I'm, not a bad thing. That's not, not a bad, bad thing. thing. By no, exactly. Exactly. So, like, I think the not like other girls trope was something I, I really struggled with when I was sure. a and like in my life experience and 
my education, I realized like, I just like what I like and it doesn't have to be like, uncool or or super super weird and you, don't, and you don't have to defend what you like either you just can you can yeah. just like it exactly I like it because yeah. i like it and yeah. it doesn't matter how i identify right <laughs> Yeah, I, I watched your your interview is uh, on the Zach Sang show, and it was a really oh, great man. conversation. And there was this there was this part because I mean, you started your career work. You I mean, before you kind of broke into this, you were working at the NFL, and yeah. and and there was this comment that you made in that interview that you kind of were talking about how like that was what you all, always sort of wanted to do, and there were men yeah. in your family that played football, and yeah. but I'm it, it was sort of understanding your desire to go into that world and maybe rethinking that at all was that part of this process of like okay why did I want to do that because I mean you said you played sports and you still I know you still like like the NFL but like it, it, did did was that part of any of those kind of unlearnings or just understanding why yeah absolutely I mean I, even when I went in when I started therapy I was like I even really like football right like like, cause I, it's just, it's, it's important to have those really hard conversations with yourself because I feel like if you're honest with yourself, you're able to unpack it and let it go. Right. So like, I genuinely was like, did I really like sports or did I like that? It made me different. I like had that conversation with myself and with my therapist. Cause I was <laughs> like, I just want to understand like what my drive was and being there, like why I felt the need to be there. And I think even in my interview with Zach, like I love him and Dan, like they're amazing. But even like in them, in talking to them, I even realized then that I think a bigger part of it was wanting to redeem my dad. Like my dad played in the NFL and my dad got cut. And I felt like, you know what, like he could do it. Um, and I'm going to do it too. Like I'm going to bring us back and we're going to like kind of repay. Yeah. Memory. And I think that was my, honestly, my driving force was that because I feel like nothing really moves me quite like my family does, um, other than my own, like, just neurotic behavior <laughs> uh, and my incessant need to be right. Uh, and when that part aside, I think like my family moves me more than anything. So I genuinely believe that I do love football and I, I do enjoy watching it. I think it's just, it was something that because I let go of so many biases over the years and then in doing this platform, I was like, I really need to like, make sure I'm like fine tuned up here. Like I need to make sure I'm checking in with myself. And that was part of it. I was like, okay, yeah. I need to unpack whether or not I even really like sports because like my sister, <laughs> the one of the funniest things she's ever said to me was like, she told me um, the biggest thing I'm grateful for, I mean, one of the biggest things I'm grateful for about unpacking being a pygmy is like not pretending to like football anymore. Cause my sister does not care about sports like at all. Um, even though she grew up playing sports alongside me and we had the same childhood, um, she realized she was like, yeah, I hate football. Uh, I hate that. I like to watch for funsies, but I'm also like cool. Never watching it ever, which is there we freeing. go. It's such a yeah, freeing 100%, thing. Like, oh it go. my God. So yeah, that was definitely a huge part of yeah, it. For sure. Yeah. <laughs> um so for the past year and a half you've been doing the comment section in your podcast and you have these really fantastic conversations you bring on great guests a lot of people a lot of people who like your existing audience is probably like familiar with or well aware of um mm -hmm. yesterday I watched your one with Br Brittany Broski and just it was a female gaze that's that was an early one I think and yeah. um you you you, ha you it's it's a great combo of humor and and teaching and just like having in-depth really cool conversations what are what are some things that stick out to you that that you've learned through having these conversations with your with your great guests? I think what I learned the most in doing the comment section is more so. Well, first of all, that like um, each creator that I've met and had the pleasure of having on my show, um, I like love and adore um, personally on like a personal level, and then obviously getting to like work with them on a professional level is even greater. But I, I feel like I've learned especially that a, a lot of different people that you see online or you see in the, you know, as a celebrity, they have they have so many different sides to them um, that are not always platformed in their socials because totally. uh, for obvious reasons. I mean, I think they just choose, pick and choose what they want to share, which same for me. Um, but I think the beauty of that is that I just kind of let the show go where it wants to go. And like, I just meet them wherever they want to meet me. And then we just talk whether or not we stay on topic de depends on like doesn't whether matter. Yeah. we get there, but it doesn't matter. I think that's the beauty of the show is that um, you get to see different sides of people that you love and adore for one specific reason. Like the one I'm thinking of right now is like JVN. 
love and adore Jonathan just aired his episode but on on the episode with him I really got to like talk to him more on a intellectual level like we really got to discuss very high level things talking about internalized biases where they come from and all of that we discussed was stuff that he learned on his podcast and like with all the experts that he sits down with and I think that's like obviously JVN has no shortage of fans like they are so incredibly popular as they should be but I think like that side of them is not something that you always see unless you listen to their podcast like consistently. Right. And I feel like on my show, that was a way for them to be seen in a much different light than what they're normally seen for, which they're so talented and so funny and so entertaining and just amazing overall. But they are so smart too. Like they Oh are yeah. So oh my gosh. Smart. You can tell. Yeah. And there's and they're so open to learning and growing. And I think that's a beautiful thing. And I think getting to see those different sides of people that come on my show that are so popular and well-known for one specific thing. It's like my show is the place to get to show all the other things that they're proud of, that they represent, that they care about, that's important to them. Even like when I had Quana on my show, like Quana Chasing Horse, like obviously she's a stunning, gorgeous model. She is huge for representation, like native representation in the fashion and modeling mm -hmm. industries. Very, very minute. And then you got to, she got to come on my show and talk about all the things she does care about in when it comes to indigenous representation, rights, reparations, whatever it may be. She got to platform all of these different causes that she cares about, that she works on consistently. Um, but that's just not what people know her for. So I think that's like the beauty of the show and the most like exciting part of it. Yeah. For me. And it's something I learned over, now we're going on, like, I think we filmed 90 episodes yesterday. Wow. So like, in the learning yeah. process, I'm like, I, that's like my, one of my favorite parts about it is getting to show them in a different light and well, show. Yeah, well, well, I think awesome. it's interesting because it's like, you know, we, I think a lot of like kind of breakout internet or fame that sort of originates on the internet. It's like, you have to, most of the time it's somebody like finding a niche that really works and it just, yeah. you lean into that. And then within that you create this, you find and create this amazing community around you, but yeah. it also like not not for everybody it can pigeonhole you into like only talking about one thing online or only y to z and if you don't have that other space or that place to go longer form like you have now with your pot with like you have with the podcast like yeah i think that that's really that's that's a really interesting point i think that like that, that kind of gets lost i think in sort of the fast pace online world these days yeah and i think i think they're ex i think that's one of the things they love too about the show is they get to talk about other stuff that they yeah. love and other things that they're interested in and other things that they care about and like that's like something that's so important to them and i'm no exception to that like i say of course thing, yeah like my niche was making fun of men and making them upset <laughs> love that i can still do that but i i can do a lot of other things too i can be funny without talking about them specifically i can talk about a lot of things and be funny and that's or be entertaining or be informative or be helpful in some or impactful in some way so yeah it's like yeah, it's, yeah. it's a beautiful blend of all I, of it I, I have a question when did when did you first what's your first memory of like realizing that people found you funny or that you, and that you were funny. Interesting. Um, I think it was, um, it, it kind of came, became more clear to me when I was like in high school, um, going into college kind of, because I've always been very, I don't know if you can tell by me, but I'm very loud and, and like very independent and very outgoing. Um, but I think like, as I got older, I just love to tell stories. Like I love to tell people things that happen. I can make the most mundane thing funny and exciting that's like me feeling myself a little bit but like that's all good, I, good story you're a good storyteller yeah totally yeah right. so I, I think like that was my first real memory of me being funny was like um someone telling me that oh tell them the story that you told me yesterday and then them laughing like it's the first time they heard it um even when I was in college like I was a sports editor of my school newspaper for a couple years and we had like an office and sometimes I'd go into the office and um, it'd be a really hard day, like a finals week, midterms, whatever. And um, some of my coworkers were like, tell me a funny story so I can laugh, so I can feel better. And I did that so many times. Like they would all sit around like a campfire and I would just tell them something there you go. insane that happened to me. And then they, we'd all laugh and everybody feel better. So I think those are like my really tangible memories of me right. being like, I'm pretty funny. Like I think right. I'm Yeah, and it works. Yeah, totally, totally. Yeah. Um, I wanted to end with two kind of fun topics. One is I know that you went to the Eras tour this summer, as did I. Yes. Big Swifty, <laughs> and I just wanted to like hear your thoughts on like high level thoughts on just like being a Swifty and like being at the Eras tour because to me, like again, and I'm I'm a 
cisgendered white man going into this space but like to me just like observing the crowd and being part of that for almost four hours like yeah it felt like a really rare space that felt like very safe like very con- kind of completely accepting free of misogyny like it just felt like a place where women were really celebrated kind of yeah. through watching and experiencing Taylor all together yeah what was your experience like being at the Eras tour because it it, it was kind of like a spiritual experience <laughs> in, in, for, for me honestly like totally being on like that's how it felt yeah I mean I love that first of all um and I think my experience was very similar I think in the sense that like it just felt like a space where it's like it's it's, I kind of align it with like the Barbie movie coming out in the same year it's like it's the year of being proud of being a girl of being a woman of identifying as a woman of living a like living in our shoes and living in our experience like sharing our shared experiences with each other I think that you know Taylor Swift's like energy the 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 environment that she cultivates is very like it's driven by women just wanting to like have fun and love the things that they love and and be proud of it and not be ashamed to like be excited or be happy or sing or dance or whatever it may be um and I feel like that's like the space where you get to just be free like it's so Mm -hmm. it sounds so corny but it's like you get to be free of of being perceived by men and being like perceived by men who find it corny or lame. It's just like a space, I think, for people to really, really love what they want to love and not care. Like yeah. be, be like proud of it, be happy about it. Like even with like the friendship bracelets and and the exchanging of it, like I exchanged all of mine <laughs> like the minute I got there. Um, I just find that so sweet and endearing. Yeah. And I feel like the same thing with the Barbie movie, like what it gives is again, like permission to love what you want to love and like have fun, like just have a good time and and live free of of fear, of judgment. And a lot of times, I'll, a lot of that is, you know, akin to like men being in the same area or like a sick man. And I think- my experience was similar to that in the sense that I'm like, I just think it's a beautiful thing to witness, like getting to watch, getting to watch women. Of every age, by the way, of every age. Of every age and anyone else who's just not an awful man, getting to watch them experience like joy and warmth. is just like, that is like truly to me, like what, what a privilege like life is to be loved and supported by women. Like, you just need them. You need that kind of like energy in your life, I think, to feel fulfilled, to feel supported. So, and I am so lucky that I have so many women in my life that I love and adore. And like, I think platonic soulmates are are very, very real. Yes. And I, have, I, I feel like I have multiple, which I'm so grateful for. And they're all women. And that's because it's important. And I feel Amazing. like that's, that's a space where you get to like, really feel it. Like you feel like a tangible energy. I felt like that when I saw Barbie too. So yeah, like, it's totally something that like, it's amazing the tears because it's so like, it feels like silly in the moment, but when you think about it, like we never really had spaces like that where we could just be, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like, yeah, exist. absolutely. No. And, and I, and you, 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 you I felt that in, in being there. Um, yeah. And lastly, totally different topic, but <laughs> I know that when you were younger, you wrote a Jonas Brothers fanfic about something, <laughs> yeah. and, I, and I forget where it was, but you said that you can't find it, and you had, like, promised yeah. to post online, but, like, it is basically nowhere to be seen. <laughs> what was it about, and also, as you've gotten older, how has your relationship with the Jonas Brothers sort of changed <laughs> over the years? I mean, yeah, it I sounds like you were in deep. It sounds like you were in deep. I was, I was, <laughs> I was balls deep in that. I was obsessed to say the least. I just, oh, I love them so much. And I, when I wrote the fan fiction, I think I was like 12, 13 ish. It was before high school. I think I was like 11 to 13 age. Um, and I hand wrote it like a colonial woman um, in a notebook. <laughs> um which is just so ancient the internet definitely existed at that time I mean it wasn't where it is now but like I could have easily written on a computer didn't um it was 
the gist of it was essentially I wasn't even in the story that's the crazy part like normally when you write fanfics like there's like your name I wasn't even in it which is stupid I just wrote like <laughs> I just literally wrote like a story um I, I don't even know if it classifies as fanfic because a fan wasn't in it uh, but <laughs> It was, um, I, I, if I remember the timeline correctly, I think it took place during like the Hannah Montana Best of Both Worlds tour. Which and I went to. I'm jealous. I wish I got <laughs> to see it in person. I saw the movie when it came out in theaters, but I didn't get to the tour tour. Um, yeah, so icon, legend. Uh, it took place during that time when the Jonas Brothers were with her. And I do believe that, I think Nick and Miley were a thing in my story. Um, everyone else was a side character because I was a Nick girl. Um, and so like, I just kind of focused on their story kind of, which is so weird because I, I, again, I wasn't even in it. So it's not, <laughs> it doesn't make sense. Like, it's it not like, it's not like you got Nick in the end. It was, it was just like, it was about. No, it was right. just like, maybe Nick and Miley are together. Like that was like literally the, oh my God. It's so I love it. And, uh, it's amazing. Yeah. It had, it had plot twists and dips and churns. I wish I had it so I could like read exactly how i uh, wrote it I was, oh my god the it's cringe. just gonna be it's just gonna be the myth of your of your jonas brothers fan fit it's just gonna yeah be, you know that, <laughs> yeah. that's where it li- that's where it lives now you know my community is so pissed off at me because i keep <laughs> I, like when i they talk about it they're like where is it i want to see it i don't have a girl if i had it that's content i would love to platform it. of course oh my um, god yeah. i mean i and now fast forward to now like i mean i saw them on broadway in new york which was so fun and oh, i was jealous um, which I put like a literal fan video I made on YouTube, like when I was like 14, um, my sister, my friend and I made a video to try and win tickets uh, to a show and like meet and greet passes. And they said to post it on YouTube. The irony of that is my sister doesn't know geography very well. So she <laughs> thought it said it was exclusive to the tri-state area. I am from California. So like <laughs> we still submitted it and um, got Listen. disqualified because we don't live in the tri-state area so um shoot your like, shot shoot your shot though listen, you know and she was like what's this tri-state area and i'm like yeah girl we don't live in it forget it <laughs> and so like we made that video for no reason but when i worked with sea geek and i got to go see them on broadway which was amazing um i included that in my video for them i was like my video uh of me being a fan and i think that kind of gave me more like since I gave them that video, I feel like they forgive me a little bit for not being able to locate the fan fiction. <laughs> so it's it's, um, it's 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 kind of a full circle, a full circle. Very moment. much so, yeah. Very but I so. I work I have worked with I worked with them personally. Awesome. I made with them. Um, it was great. It was it was fun. It was a it was a right. goof and a laugh, and it was and very enjoyable. And their concert was so fun after. So I love that. Oh my god, <laughs> yeah. I love that for you. <laughs> Um, yeah. Well, Drew, I, th- I think we're out of time, but um, I loved getting to chat with you and um, everyone listen to the comment section because it's an amazing podcast, amazing conversations are had and um, with some great guests. So thanks again for taking the time. It w- it's been really fun. Oh my gosh, of course. Thank you so much uh, yeah. for sitting and talking with me. I appreciate of it. Of course, of course. Thanks for tuning in to We Should Talk. I hope you enjoyed the interview. You can find out more about In The Know at intheno.com. You can follow me, Gibson John, at Gibsonoma on Twitter and Instagram. And you can listen to all of our interviews, past and future, by searching We Should Talk wherever you get your podcasts. Hope to see you next time.